morning, folks. It's um, Thursday, the 6th of February. Middle of a ghost town here. Um, 1.3 million people all hiding. It's dire here. It's very dire. There's people dropping on the footpath, literally. I can't wait to get out of here. It's terrible. A city of 11 million people in lockdown. So here I am sitting at home because after returning from Hubei province at the heart of the coronavirus outbreak, everybody's told you need to go into quarantine. You can't be exposed to others for several weeks. More than 2,000 dead, tens of thousands infected. <laughs> Rising anger over how the crisis is being handled. Local officials in Wuhan did withhold information. The doctors in Wuhan who were talking about it were explicitly told to shut up. And scientists racing to find a vaccine. We just don't know how this uh, outbreak is going to develop or how many people are ultimately going to be infected or ultimately going to die from this disease. Tonight on Four Corners, how the coronavirus outbreak sparked a global emergency. I'm absolutely fucking petrified. The police are actually knocking on doors and taking temperatures, and if people have got a temperature, they're dragging them out. You don't get a fucking say in it. You don't get an option. city in central China. It sits on the banks of Yangtze River. It's a mega city. Wuhan is also home to the second most number of universities in China. People around the world come to Wuhan to study. It's right in the heart of the country, geographically as well as economically. All these trains and planes are coming through there. And to have the virus outbreak start there, it's almost like if you wanted to pick the worst place for it to break out in, that would be the place you'd release it. In early December, people in Wuhan begin falling ill with a mystery virus. The first infections in Wuhan started in early December, and I believe the first case in December the 1st. Um, when a new infectious disease appears, it does take a little time to register and become aware that it's new. Um, so there were people presenting with a form of pneumonia, Local doctors suspect the virus originated in the city's seafood and wildlife market. So we think the virus probably originated from bats because that's what the genetic data tell us. But often there's an intermediary animal host. Uh, in this case, they think pangolins might be implicated, which are a mammal. And that intermediary animal host might have been at the markets. Uh, we, we don't think that it's from eating those things specifically, like through the gastrointestinal tract, but more from handling them, from touching the contaminated meat. So uh, somewhere in that market, we believe there must have been um, a contaminated animal source that infected the first cluster of humans. In late December, as the number of cases increases, doctors in Wuhan begin sharing information in a private chat group. Well before any of us knew about the coronavirus, there were people who tried to sound the alarm. So there were a group of whistleblowers who'd heard that there was this virus cluster and they started speaking about it. Now, in particular, there was one doctor, Li Wenliang. He posted on a chat group with his former university classmates that people had been coming in with what he thought was the SARS virus. 
Seven SARS cases were confirmed in the Huanan seafood market. The main mode of transmission of the virus is droplet transmission at close range, or contact with respiratory secretions of patients. This can cause a special pneumonia that is evidently contagious and capable of affecting multiple organ systems. It is also called SARS. The patients were isolated in the emergency department of a hospital. Everyone, please be careful. That's scary. SARS is back. The outbreak revived the spectre of SARS, another type of coronavirus which killed 774 people in 2002 and 2003. The reason why they would have been so concerned at the prospect is this was SARS uh, was threefold. First of all, SARS was super infectious. Second, it had a relatively high mortality rate of 10%. And third, a large number of healthcare workers were actually died from SARS because of the complexity with stopping transmission. And I think that was the real concern. On the same day as Dr. Lee's warning, the Wuhan Health Commission sends an urgent internal notice to hospitals on the treatment of pneumonia of unknown cause. Some medical institutions in our city have seen patients steadily with pneumonia of unknown cause. If you find patients with unexplained pneumonia, actively adjust the resources and treat them on the spot. The notice warns them to keep the outbreak quiet. Without authorization, no units or individuals shall release treatment-related information to the outside. I have no doubt that local governments have reported the situation to the central government. So local governments were not accountable to the people at that time, but to the central government. They adopted the policy of concealing the truth from the public, but starting to control the epidemic internally. This contradiction prevented them from properly mobilizing to deal with the spread of the epidemic. Dr. Lee and the other doctors continue to share information. Be careful. The WeChat group of our class has been banned. The latest news is the coronavirus infection has been confirmed, and virus classification is in progress. Please don't spread the word and ask your family and loved ones to take precautions. Do not go to the Hornan seafood market in the near future. So when this group of uh, doctors, I think they were university classmates from Wuhan, began sharing the information they had about a strange new virus on this sort of joint WeChat group, um, uh, they were doing what you'd expect medical professions to do, to try and sort of pool information and see what was actually happening. Uh, but of course, that's a kind of dangerous thing to do in China. I think there's little doubt uh, right now that local officials in Wuhan did withhold information. They've admitted as much. Uh, the doctors in Wuhan who were talking about it were explicitly told to shut up. Dr. Lee and his colleagues are hauled in for questioning by Wuhan police. After investigation and verification by the public security organs, eight offenders have been summoned and handled according to law. The police will investigate and punish with zero tolerance those illegal acts that fabricate and spread rumors and disrupt social order. Dr. Lee was disciplined by his own hospital. He was even picked up by the police and taken in and castigated and told not to spread rumors. This is what happens when you are saying things publicly that the Communist Party doesn't like. You're spreading rumors. Even if somebody is trying to tell the world about a potentially dangerous virus, the first instinct is to shut them up. Despite the risk of retribution, critics like Dr Wu Chang who already lost his university job for defying a ban by President Xi on teaching democracy, continue to speak out over the government's handling of the crisis. They were basically concealing the truth. Although internal controls were in place, the information kept from the public caused the outbreak of the disaster and the spread of the disease. That's the key point in this saga. You know, they lost about two weeks, maybe three weeks, just when the virus was at its sort of nascent point, uh, just at a time where they could have traced it, uh, just at a time where perhaps they could have checked it 
more substantially, but that was lost because it got caught up in the politics of the inf information flow and information surveillance in China. Four weeks after the first infections, China notifies the World Health Organization of the outbreak. Things are about to get worse. In early January, millions of Chinese are preparing to travel to and from Wuhan to celebrate Chinese New Year with their families. If you were to pick the most dangerous time, the worst time for a virus to break out here, the worst time for it to spread quickly across China, and even around the world, it would be the Lunar New Year. You have hundreds of millions of people crisscrossing China, traveling overseas, and because of that mass migration, the largest mass migration annually in the world, I mean, it was just a terrible time for this virus outbreak to, to happen. Australian resident Ying Wang, who lives in Melbourne, is preparing to visit Wuhan with her husband and two children when she hears about the outbreak. It was a couple of days after uh, our Christmas holiday in Melbourne, I got a video sent over from my cousin in Wuhan. And uh, according to the video, there was a suspected uh, SARS-like pneumonia. Um, and I asked my cousin, should I cancel my trip? We waited until probably um, the first week in January. And then there was a official announcement from our local government back in Wuhan saying that um, the disease was controllable. And then, then he, um, he sort of, um, um, I feel relieved. So um, we went out, uh, 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 we went out with our trip. Ying Wang and her family arrive in Wuhan on January 9. That same day, a 61-year-old man who had visited the seafood market becomes the first person to die of coronavirus. His death is kept quiet for two days. During the most crucial time of the spread of disease in early Jan, Wuhan and Hubei were holding annual political meetings. As a result, the first death which occurred on January 9 was not announced until January 11. After January 11, the data on deaths and confirmed cases plateaued and the numbers had not changed at all. I believe that the local authorities concealed the truth from the public due to political concerns. On January 22, the government finally acknowledges the gravity of the situation at a press conference in Beijing. Bindu存在变异的可能，疫情存在着进一步扩大的风险。当前政治村运、人员流动性激增，客观上加大了疫情传播的风险和防控的难度，绝不能掉以轻心，要。Nine people have died and 440 people are confirmed to have contracted a mysterious coronavirus as China works to stop it spreading during the Lunar New Year travel rush. It was um, 22nd twenty second of January, that was the turning point, it was um, Wednesday and just bad news started coming in. Uh, um, it started with the Chinese official news saying that um, um, it's getting getting much worse than, than they expected. And then all of a sudden, I think it was the next day, 23rd, I remember, I woke up quite late, like 10 a.m. And suddenly, and my, my dad just told me, oh, we can't go out now. We can't go out. We can't get out of our apartment. There's 
There's been a dramatic development this morning in the Chinese city of Wuhan, which is the epicentre of an outbreak of a deadly new virus. All public transport, buses, trains, ferries and the airport have been shut down as authorities scramble to contain the spread of the coronavirus. I mean, when the authorities decided to lock down that whole province of Hubei, that's like locking down the entire population of Italy and telling them you can't leave that province. It was really the moment when everybody knew, all right, this is a big problem. When Wuhan went into lockdown, I think January the 23rd, and then flights and greater lockdown measures across China, this is unprecedented in the history of modern medicine. We've never tried. We know that containment can work, but it's never really been done at this large scale. The day I learned that Wuhan was in lockdown, I felt quite shocked. And I started immediately start worrying about food, food supply and I had to stop everything on the day, just started um, messaging everybody to find out is that really the official news, how, how serious is this announcement. By late January, Wuhan's hospitals are struggling to cope. And medical staff are under intolerable pressure. <laughs> With patient numbers surging, construction begins on two new hospitals, with one scheduled to open in just over a week. Even though Chinese authorities have effectively shut down several cities, the World Health Organization says it's not yet a global health emergency. So obviously the whole world was watching very closely through January as this epidemic unfolded and people were very concerned, a lot of experts were concerned and uh, felt that the public health emergency of international concern should have been declared earlier. I think people were harking back to Ebola and what happened there and they were afraid of um, delays that might have been very costly in terms of the ability to save people's lives. Australia's first case of coronavirus has been confirmed in Victoria as New South Wales announces it has two probable cases. So the minute we made the diagnosis of the first case in Australia, we knew how significant that was and we knew that we wanted to culture the virus. In a major breakthrough, Australian scientists become the first outside China to isolate the virus in a laboratory. It's definitely, okay. definitely growing. It started at 30, so right. that's three logs, so a thousand times stronger. Awesome. So it's definitely growing. So we've got it. Fantastic. Yeah. CSIRO scientists begin growing the virus in their highest security laboratory reserved for the most deadly pathogens. We don't actually know how dangerous this virus is. We know it kills people, uh, but we don't know how many and we don't know exactly what the mechanism is by, by which this virus kills people. So at the moment, we're uh, taking the highest level of precautions.
hour staff can only usually work about four hours in those suits and in those conditions because it's very stressful to imagine you're actually working with such high volatile agents. The most important thing that we're doing at the moment is growing the virus to produce more of it so that we can understand more about the characteristics of this virus uh, and also how it behaves in our biological model so that we can see the progress of the disease. So we will, we will then introduce the virus into our test animals, uh, on this occasion ferrets, because their respiratory system is very similar to humans. And the idea here is to understand how that infection progresses and how it behaves. This is very important for us to um, understand uh, because if we can't uh, understand how the infection progresses and in which way it progresses, uh, we can't understand how vaccines work. China, the escalating number of infections prompts a rare outburst of anger online against authorities. What's 那些悲剧今天是大年初一啊 It can be said that the more than 900 million Chinese citizens who are equipped with smartphones have been extremely dissatisfied with the situation of Wuhan pneumonia in the past one month or so. From my own observation, this level of dissatisfaction is unprecedented in the past eight years. They have been tremendously dissatisfied with Wuhan local government's ineffectiveness in epidemic and disaster relief. The predicament the Wuhan people have been put into from the city lockdown, the paralysis of the local medical institutions, and the huge risk they have to face. As authorities desperately try to stop the virus spreading, Wuhan is effectively cut off from the rest of China. We decided to go into Hubei province to have a look what it was like right inside the virus hot zone. As we got closer and closer to Hubei, the roadblocks were becoming more serious. And in fact, it looked like something out of an apocalyptic movie. The police are making all the cars pull over to the side. So, basically, that's the border that way. Uh, the police have told us that we can drive in, but we can't drive out. We drove through a series of ghost towns. I mean, nobody on the streets, shops closed, the shutters were down. And this is during spring festival. Normally, this is a time when you'd have fireworks, families, friends gathering to have meals together, celebrating, being happy, and instead it was completely dead and in fact, pretty eerie. The outbreak of the coronavirus in China has finally been declared a global health emergency after a rapid escalation in the number of infections during the past week. There are almost 8,000 cases in 18 countries, including nine in Australia. So here I am sitting at home and reporting from where I live. That's because after returning from Hubei province at the heart of the coronavirus outbreak, everybody's told you need to go into quarantine. You can't be exposed to others for several weeks. 
this city, Beijing, if I look out the window, it's dead. I mean, there are hardly any people in the streets. Friends here don't want to go outdoors. That's because they're afraid of catching the coronavirus. And the same is happening all over the country, all these mega cities in China. The government is taking drastic action to stem the coronavirus. Foreign nationals coming from China are now banned from entering the country. I think from a disease control point of view, we want to continue these for as long as is feasible. There's just so many major economic consequences of the travel ban that I think at some point we'll have to make the decision to um, lift the bans. But if we can keep them going as long as possible, that will be beneficial from a disease control point of view. Hundreds of Australians remain trapped in Hubei province. So this is um, a view from my window and it's been really good weather today, but um, we're not going out. And this is our central garden at level six. So it's a bit shame that um, we're stuck at home. Otherwise, it could be a really good day out. I really just want a more firm answer from anywhere, really, from WHO or, or, or my local government. So how, how bad really is? I, I'm still having this question. How serious is this whole pandemic? Even though every day we watch the numbers, infected number of people, also the death toll keep going up. Just, yeah, I, I need to, I don't know. I need somebody to assure me this is, um, I don't know, I feel like the end of the world. Morning, folks. It's um, Thursday, the 6th of February. Middle of a ghost town here. Um, 1.3 million people all hiding. It's raining, it's a miserable day. Death toll was like 545 today. Um, 16,800 odd people in hospital in my district. Waiting on DFAT to give us an answer about um, when I can get out of here. Australian Tim McLean is stranded on the outskirts of Wuhan. He's trying to get his Chinese partner a visa to come to Australia. Uh, Foreign Affairs just contact me. I just hung up the phone. And, um, they just confirmed and, and wanted to let me know that uh, my my spouse, Xu Shong, didn't make the list for the flight with Qantas and asked me if I was still um, interested in leaving. Um, I informed them that I'm not leaving without her. It's dire here, it's very dire. There's queues outside the hospitals now. We're not allowed near them. There's people dropping on the footpath, literally, okay? I know how bad it is. I can't wait to get out of here. It's terrible. So this is them spraying right outside our um, front door. They've been doing this all through the city regularly. The local council have been going out and spraying disinfectant around everybody's doorways. So I suspect they're spraying to stop infections coming out of the sewer. I better go in and shut the door. I've seen medical folks turn up two doors away from me, 20 metres from my front door and take a lady away that was infected. They also took a son. The son um, 
returned home 24 hours later, he was OK. Uh, we haven't seen or heard of the lady since. So people have been concerned about the human rights aspects of quarantine and um, isolation of cases, quarantine of contacts, etc. And that, that's been happening on a very large scale in China, but also in Australia and other countries. Um, from a disease control point of view, um, putting aside other issues, from a disease control point of view, it works. <laughs> Videos emerge on social media of authorities using increasingly drastic measures. Around China, residents post scenes claiming officials are welding the doors of apartment buildings shut so people can't get out. I'm very concerned about getting this virus. I'm not even 100 metres away from one of the hospitals. It's full. I've seen people entering that hospital. I've seen people getting rolled out on stretchers out of that hospital. It's literally across the road from where I come out of my apartment. Now, that's concerning. My hospitals here are full. Uh, we run out of medical supplies here. There's no um, PPE or personal protective equipment available anymore, so the doctors are all gone to the bigger hospitals. They're shipping our sick and our, um, you know, the people that are in bad condition, they're taking them to Wuhan. The Wuhan hospitals are also full now. By early February, the virus is in 25 countries, with 216 cases outside China. The most likely way that the virus is traveling outside of China is by infected people. So these people, they are perhaps in the early stages of the disease and perhaps not showing uh, very many clinical signs. So they are uh, able to uh, get onto planes and they're quite happy to travel. Uh, and in all innocence, they are spreading uh, the, the, the disease as they travel. We think probably 10% or less of all infections in China are being detected at the current time. We estimate that maybe up to you know, 50,000 new infections a day occurring in China, which is obviously much larger than the official case numbers. Almost 4,000 passengers, including more than 200 Australians, have spent their first 24 hours officially in quarantine on board a cruise ship off Japan. They'll be isolated on board for the next fortnight, with some passengers growing anxious as their crucial medicines are beginning to run out. We know that cruise ships are at high risk for outbreaks. There are, it's well documented that you get outbreaks of influenza, norovirus, gastro, and so on on cruise ships. They are closed small communities in a very a small space compared to, say, a country. So obviously you can get more intense transmission once an outbreak starts. Shocking news breaks that the man who had first warned of the outbreak has died of coronavirus. 
In China, censors are working overtime to contain an outpouring of anger and grief over the death of the doctor who blew the whistle on the coronavirus crisis. Li Wenliang died from the virus in a Wuhan hospital five weeks after being punished by authorities for warning others of a dangerous new virus. There was a, a huge outpouring of grief, anger, frustration uh, on Chinese social media, and not just from so-called netizens, you know, on Chinese-style Reddit forums or something, but from the Supreme Court uh, of China, who put out a statement saying that, you know, these doctors were heroes, they should have been allowed to do their job. The public intellectuals and the public both realised that Dr Li represents the conscience of China. He was suppressed from the beginning from telling the truth. He could have saved the livelihood of tens of thousands of people, or thousands of people's lives. But all this was concealed due to the authority's suppression of free speech. I believe the public expressed their dissatisfaction with the government by commemorating him. The death toll reaches a critical milestone, overtaking the numbers killed by SARS. After being conspicuously absent, President Xi emerges on state media to assert his authority. <laughs> she has really lost control of the narrative um, and he's struggling to get it back. Now, if that goes on, uh, if they don't get on top of the virus, then that can really damage Xi's image, I think, even with all ordinary Chinese people. And that has pro potentially profound implications because two, three years down the track, when he's meant to be reappointed, maybe his enemies will use this against him. So the people directed this kind of dissatisfaction directly to Xi himself and Xi's style of governance, which is, I believe, the most serious threat to Xi Jinping. This is because the foundation of his power is based largely on populism, and the loss of this populist foundation will undoubtedly destabilize his position in the party. Australians still trapped in the coronavirus epicenter in China are tonight preparing for a second attempt at an evacuation flight to Darwin. There is a seat available for my partner, Sean, and myself on the next available flight out of Wuhan, which apparently is leaving at midnight tonight. Uh, we've got three or four hours to get to the airport. Uh, they've sent us, sent us all our passes, etc., so we can get through the checkpoints. Um, it's all confirmed. We've got the emails. We've got the thumbs up. So we're out of here. We're heading home. Can't wait. And uh, super excited. Today is our last day in Wuhan. It's been a pretty, pretty, um, pretty long journey, really. In the past two weeks, more than, more than two weeks, we've been um, house quarantined for more than two weeks. So tomorrow we're going to get out and go to the airport and come back to Australia. So it's still, it's still unreal for me. Airport 
toll gate. So it looks like we're going through a checkpoint. Mm. It's 2.30, kids are not the slave. I'm super tired. We're still waiting, about half of the plane. Still waiting um, to be cleared of security and passport control and stuff. A lot of paperwork, a lot of screening, a lot of questions. It's just very, very stressful, really. Let's go. Out of here. Yes, we're out of here, going home. <laughs> Tim McLean isn't on the flight. Quarantine restrictions mean he hasn't been able to get any transport to the airport, so he's still stuck in Hubei province. I'm absolutely fucking petrified now. 1,300 odd people are dead here. The police are actually knocking on doors and taking temperatures, and if people have got a temperature, they're dragging them out, mate. You don't get a fucking say in it. You don't get an option. You get taken away and put with a bunch of other sick people. Not only are we in quarantine, but it's beyond quarantine now. It's, I don't even know what to call it. It's quite terrifying knowing that people can knock on your door here and just drag you out for no reason at all because you've got a temperature. At the moment, we don't have a good understanding of the real mortality rate for the novel coronavirus. It's estimated about 2%. So if the mortality rate's 2%, if it's 1%, even if it's 0.5%, and 300 million people get infected, that's a lot of people that could potentially die. Because if you think back into the Spanish flu, Spanish flu, um, enormous numbers of people died, but the actual mortality rate was less than 1%, but a huge number of people were infected. Health Organization is this morning warning the coronavirus could pose a greater global threat than terrorism. A virus can have more powerful consequences than any terrorist action. And that's true. And if the world doesn't want to wake up and consider this enemy virus as public enemy number one, I don't think we will learn from our lessons. We just don't know what this, how this uh, outbreak is going to develop or how many people are ultimately going to be infected or ultimately going to die from this disease. We don't yet know exactly how the virus is evolving. We don't know uh, how many people are actually infected that are not revealed to be infected. Uh, and we don't know how many people are dying that are misdiagnosed as dying from other, other, other disease. So this is a real problem for us to be able to make any real prediction or to model the spread of this disease. I think the worst case scenario is that we are unable to contain the virus, that we see sustained human-to-human -human transmission in many parts of the world. The World Health Organization says the window of opportunity to contain the coronavirus outbreak is narrowing. The statement comes as concerns grow in South Korea and the Middle East about the number of cases. There have also been more cases confirmed among Australians evacuated from a cruise ship in Japan.
So I really don't know what the near future is going to bring. We've got no information about how long we're going to be in here. There's no indication whatsoever. I've got sick people living next door to me. I've got sick people above me. I've got sick people across the lane from me. Some of those people have got chains on their doors so people can't access them because they're, they're ill. I'm hiding from a, a virus that you can't see and a government that you don't want to muck around with. like Four Corners Investigations delivered to your inbox, you can sign up for our newsletter. Go to abc.net.au slash four corners.